Now this video is a continuation of the last video which was on the basically the dying arts of installing central heating systems where we looked at the installation of an FNE system. So this is kind of going to continue that story because we're going to be looking at the installation of these things. Pumps in conjunction with sealed and vented systems. But guys, if you have any videos you want me to do on the dying arts of plumbing and gas, put down in the comments and I'll uh, try and sort it out for you. So, central heating pumps, let's get on with it. Now, loads of different manufacturers out there for central heating pumps. Everybody thinks Grunfoss actually invented the pump, but they didn't, it was Vilo. They were doing it years before Grunfoss came along. But everybody looks at Grunfoss as being the leading pump manufacturer, probably because they're the most expensive and they're in most of the central heating combi boilers we have now. So let's have a look at this pump closely. First of all, on the front of here, you can see it says Grunfoss, and it can see it says it's an Alpha 2 pump. It also says it's a 1560 130. So what does that mean then? Well basically the 15 means the inside diameter of the flange here. The 130 means face to face measurement. So every pump what is 130 millimeters from face to face there you could change with this pump. Like most of the Grumfoss pumps if they're pink in colour you can change the new head onto the old body as long as they're pink. Well, they kind of changed a bit when they went to the black ones where they're slightly different. But anyway, we're not looking at that, we're looking at the installation. Now what does a 60 mean on here? Well technically, what that means is, it's a 6 metre head pump. So that means it can overcome the frictional resistance of the system up to 6 metres. Should be really in pascals that, not meters. Because it's, meters isn't an SI unit where pascals is, because it's about pressure, head pressure. So technically, does that mean from the pump we can pump up to six meters? Well, not really, no, because when it gets to the six meters, you've got no flow. But anyway, we won't go into that. But that's what basically it means. It will overcome the frictional resistance of six meters. So you can have a 1550 or 1560. And a lot of boilers now have a uh, 1570. So that gives you a seven meters head frictional resistance in a combi boiler. Now a 1550 you're probably looking at, rule of thumb, it will go in a two bed house, a 1560 you're looking at a three bed house. And if you're doing four storeys you probably want a 1570. So that's basically what it means on the front of the pump head. Now, don't know whether you can see this but this pump has a flow arrow here. And this is showing the direction of the pump. But technically you don't need the flow arrow because you can see this lump here. This is where the water comes in and then comes into an impeller which then centrifugal force then increases the pressure and shoves it out of the flow end. So technically you don't need that arrow, you can just look at the lump. Now if that is against a wall and you can't see it, and just rub your hand round the back here, obviously if it's cold, don't want to do it hot, but burn yourself. And you can see this here where the water comes in, and every pump is like that, where the water will come in into the bottom side of the impeller, spun around by the impeller, increases the velocity, which increases the pressure, and it pushes it out. Now you can actually check a pump is working in three ways. One way with power on, and two ways with power off. Now, you've got to be very careful when you're checking with the power on. So we would have, this is our live neutral and earth and our wires will be connected and we would have everything turned on. And we will check between our live and earth 
and we'll be looking between uh, 230 to 250. We will be checking between live and neutral and we'll be seeing whether we've got 230 to 250 and then we check between our neutral and earth to make sure we've got no voltage or less than 5 volts. So that's how we would check to see whether we've got power going to the pump. So if you've got power going to the pump and the pump isn't turning, then the pump's not working, the pump is broken. Now it could be something like the shaft's stuck, so you could take off here and uh, see if the shaft is turning and you can see whether it's stiff or not. So that's one way of testing, but the safest way of testing pumps is with no power on. So what I've gone and done here is I've set my multimeter to the home setting of 2K. Now, I'm going to check between my live and my neutral. Now, if I have less than 100 ohms on this pump, then the pump will need replacing. And if I've got more than 900 ohms, then there could be the pump would need replacing. Now, you can see the pump has different settings. Now, if I set it to number three, which is the fastest speed, we're looking round about between 150 and 250 ohms. But a lot of the time on this speed, you will get round about 300 ohms. So let's have a look and see what we're getting on the reading. So if I go on to my neutral and then my live, I'm getting 313 ohms which is not too bad if i go to the slower setting of number two the homes reading should go up so we've now got 440 now if i go to the number one setting it should go up even more and you can see now it's gone up to 568 so that's the first way of testing whether this is working and this pump seems to be working fine now if i set this to the audible buzzer so when i put these two together you can hear the buzzing and you can see the reading. Now, if I go to my live and earth and I get a buzzing, then that means it's a dead shot and it's knackered, which it isn't. And we'll try the neutral to the earth. So we're getting nothing. So there is no dead shot. So this pump will work fine when it's installed. And it was working when it was removed. So that's basically how a pump works. Now, when we come to install them, the best way is for the shaft to be level. Because if you dip it or you tilt it, you can get problems with air in the uh, bearings at the end. Now the bearings need to be lubricated all the time with the central heating water. So putting them on an angle messes them up so you want to keep them straight you also don't want to put it down upside down like that because if you do water could drip into the electric side now this pump has four screws or four allen screws holding the head to the body now depending on where you install this you can actually use those four screws to move that head around so the electrical connection is always accessible and is not becoming a problem with water dripping on it. Also, this pump is an energy pump. So it uses far less energy than a standard free speed pump. So the more resistance it feels, the slower the pump is going to go. It does that kind of in a combi boiler, we call them ERP, or energy rated product pumps, in combi boilers now. So all combi boilers have to have ERP pumps in them. All central heating systems replacement pumps now have to have energy efficient pumps. You can't put a standard pump in now. So if you're coming to replace an old standard pump, you will need to replace it with a pump like this. This is what this has been designed for. So the Alpha 2 will replace the standard uh, Grunfoss central heating pumps. Now, if you're worried about replacing a pump in a combi boiler, and you know it's a Grunfoss pump, then Grunfoss have an app called Go Replace. So if I click on the app, what I've got to do is, I've got to take a picture of the batch and I've got to make sure it's in focus. Take a picture of it and it comes up with the cone which is here on the pump. Press confirm and it tells me that I can replace this old pump 
with a UP53 1550 or slash 65 130. So you should be able to take the head off this pump and then replace it with one of the new pumps. So that's a great tool for you to have on your phone if you want to replace a pump. It will also work on standard pumps in a traditional central heating system. It doesn't have to be in a combi, but I find it brilliant for that, that you can check whether a combi boiler, you can still get a replacement pump for them. So that's a quick look at the pump and how we're going to install it. But what about installing it into the system? So let's have a look at that. So this is the installation we're going to be looking at. Sorry about the crudity of the illustration, but uh, it's the best I could do. Now, first thing, the boiler we've got here is a heat only boiler. This is not a combi boiler and it's not a system boiler. Also, it's on an open vented system. It's also on an S-Plan system. So, let's take a look. First thing is, this is the flow pipe coming off the boiler. It then turns into the vent pipe. Now, the vent pipe should always rise to the F and E system in the loft. So even if you go in trying to go horizontal, you've still got to rise it. Okay, so this rises up and then goes into the feed system. This is the safety device. So if you haven't seen the video on the installation of the F and E, I will put a link down in the description. Now, the flow pipe then continues across till it comes to the auto bypass. We'll have a look at that in a minute. But we have the cold water coming out of the F and E and then joining in to the flow pipe. Now this is called the close coupled system. And as long as we are no more than 150 mil apart between the vent and the cold feed, it will put negative pressure just behind the pump. That means it won't suck any air into the system through the vent and it also won't have the energy to push the water over the top of the vent because we've got the pump just as close as we can to the neutral point of this system. So this pump now will put the rest of the central heating system in positive pressure. That's what we want. Now, the reason why we need this central heating system in positive pressure is for things like radiator valves. So if a radiator valve was in negative pressure and the gland was leaking, it would suck air in through the top of the gland. But if you put it under positive pressure, it will force the water out basically rather than sucking air in. And the same kind of thing for the fittings on plastic pipe. Now, you should use barrier pipe on uh, central heating systems. You don't need barrier pipe on hot water and cold water, but for central heating systems, you require barrier pipe. But the fittings aren't under barrier pipe. So they can still suck air in through the O-ring if you've got the fittings under negative pressure. So it's really important that we keep as much of the heating system under this positive pressure. Now on a combi boiler or a system boiler, the pumps are actually on the return, but they have to be on the return because of the diverter valve. Remember a system boiler is just a combi boiler with its guts ripped out. So they're still designed exactly the same, even though technically on a system boiler, the pump could go on the flow. So remember this is a vented system, not a sealed system. Now, why do we need an auto bypass now it has to be an automatic bypass not a gate valve not a service valve restricted and definitely not a piece of 10 mil pipe with a dint in it it's got to be automatic because the reason for that is when the boiler turns off the pump 
will be wired into the boiler. So the boiler controls the pump and it gives it what's called pump overrun. So when the switch live loses its power, it then puts keeps power onto the pump for up to five minutes basically. So it has to have somewhere to go. So if those two valves are closed, it will then send the water back down the return and circulate around this part of the system getting rid of the residual heat so the boiler then will fire up and run nicely without having to fight with residual heat now if this was a wide plan that automatic bypass is not required the reason for that is when a wide plan when the three port valve closes down it doesn't shut off completely it always has a path for the water to go. So if you've just got it on hot water only and gets up to temperature and it turns the boiler off, it will always stay open to the hot water. So when the boiler is sending the water still around with the pump overrun, it's got somewhere to go. It'll either go through the coil or it will go through the central heating system. So the automatic bypass is only required if you have an S plan and not needed if you have a Y plan. Also, once the pump starts to pump it through to the cylinder or through to the heating circuit, you can see once it goes through the coil, this return pipe for the cylinder has to be the first one back to the boiler. If you don't, you could get it circulating around the heating system upstairs. We've only got one radiator downstairs. But anyway, so, Pump, pumps it around, if it wants hot water it will pump it that way, if it wants central heating it will pump it back this way. So that's if the pump is installed in the correct location. Now if I got rid of the pump there and installed the pump there, what problem do you think we would have then? So, if you said the water would take the easiest route and pump over the top, you would be correct in saying that. So, well done. So, we don't want the pump there. Even if we put the pump on the return, which is not a good idea on a new condensing boiler because of the waterways, it would just go straight over the top again. Now, if we didn't have the neutral point, so we did away with that and put this into say the return like that let me get me a red pen and that continued across there and the pump was installed here what problem do you think we would have then well if you said it would suck the air in through the vent you would be correct so this neutral point stops that it stops pumping over the top and it stops sucking air into the system because what does air make yes if you said corrosion you are correct it makes corrosion so it's incredibly important one that we put these pumps in the correct location and two, we pick the correct pump for the installation. And three, it's set up correctly. Because if you have the pump going too fast and the velocity of the water going through the pipe is too fast, you will get noise problems. And it will become very inefficient. And if you have too slow, then the radiators don't get hot. So setting the pump up is very very important but we seem to forget all about that now because we just think ah oh, it's an energy pump we just plug it in it does it all itself but make sure you get the right size otherwise you're going to cause yourselves problems now if you come to upgrade one of these vented central heating systems and put a sealed system in a combi boiler or a system boiler or whatever you're doing and the water is black or orangey colored so you've got magnetite in there or you've got rust then that pump 
was installed in the wrong location because if a pump is installed in the correct location and you've got inhibitors in your system then you should never get sludge or rust in your central heating system. So that's my quick look at where a pump should be installed on a vented system. Now technically if it's a sealed system the pump could go anywhere in the flow. Don't ever install them on a return on a sealed system with a new high efficient boiler. You can stick them on the flow because we haven't got a vent to worry about so we're not sucking in any air or we're not pumping over the top which also creates air problems. So if that water is pumping over into that uh, F&E, it will oxygenate the water and again because the water is full of oxygen it will create corrosion. Now on the next video of the dying arts of plumbing and central heating we're going to be looking at the correct installation of the cold water storage system that feeds a vented cylinder. But remember guys, if there's any videos you want me to make on this dying art of plumbing and gas and central heating, then you put down in the comments below. So, hopefully you've liked the video, and I'll catch you on the next one. Cheers.